In 1989, a female Marine captain disappeared from her quarters without a trace. Known for her exemplary conduct, her colleagues found it hard to believe that she'd gone AWOL. Military authorities suspected she'd fallen victim to foul play. The FBI joined the investigation. They would find the decorated officer or bring her a second to justice. Shirley Russell was a determined woman, determined enough to reach the rank of captain in the United States Marine Corps. When this decorated officer turned up missing, her colleagues refused to believe she'd gone AWOL. It was unclear whether Captain Shirley Russell was dead or alive. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When a crime is committed on a military installation, it falls under federal jurisdiction. Agents would have to rely on their dedication and instinct to solve the mystery of her disappearance. The Marine Corps base at Quantico, Virginia is located 35 miles south of Washington, D.C. Since 1917, it has been headquarters to one of the nation's most selective branches of the military. Over 3,000 Marines train, work, and live on the 100 square mile base. Nearly everything in civilian life is mirrored on base, from department stores to housing. Married officers have the option of living on base in married officers' quarters, which are known as MOQ. For six months, MOQ number 394D was the home of Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell and her husband, Robert Russell. By January 1989, Captain Russell decided to end the marriage. For the next month, she would stay with a friend off base until bachelor's housing was available. Shirley packed her civilian clothes, her uniforms, and her Marine issue firearm. Robert begged her to stay, but Shirley was determined. For her, the move was fine. For Robert, the separation meant he had to move off base. As a former Marine, he would be losing his last tie to the Corps. Captain Russell continued to advance in her career as the adjutant to the commanding officer of the support battalion at the Marine Basic School. She was in charge of all personnel matters and administrative needs of the support battalion. She was known as a dedicated Marine by her peers and by her commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel James Hodges. When I first met Shirley Russell, I was very impressed with the fact that she was a black female captain because we just don't have that many in the Marine Corps and that she had come from a poor background and was making something of herself, and she seemed so energized and so eager to, uh, to keep moving up the, uh, the, the rank uh, structure. Captain Russell? While assigned together, they built a friendship based on mutual respect. I can't talk to you right now. Now is not a good time. Hodges knew that Shirley's marriage was in trouble. I'll have to talk to you later. My relationship with Shirley Russell was very special, in, even though that I was her commanding officer and her, her ultimate boss, if you will. I was very uh, close to her as sort of a, a big brother mentor. And she, we talked sometimes at, you know, after working hours about her situation, uh, her marriage, her past, and so forth. Thank you, sir. On Thursday, March 2nd, about a month after her split with Robert, Shirley requested leave from work. She needed to clean her former quarters and finalize her legal separation. 
Four days later, on Monday, March 6th, Hodges arrived at the office, expecting to find Shirley at her desk. He was surprised to find her office empty. Shirley had a perfect work record. She had never been late to report. And when I walked in the door, I asked uh, Major Buck Bourgeois right away, and I said, where's Shirley? And he said, sir, she's not here. And instantly, I felt like, oh no, something has happened to her. Lieutenant Colonel Hodges investigated the unauthorized absence. Captain Russell had recently moved into bachelor officer's quarters on base. Hodges hoped he would find her at home. Captain Russell. Captain Russell. As the missing captain's commanding officer, Hodges had authorization to search the room. Captain Russell. There was no sign of her and no indication she had moved out. The Marines returned to the office and contacted the captain's husband, who now lived off base. Hodges knew that Robert Russell had helped Shirley clean and paint their vacated quarters over the weekend. They arranged to meet at the couple's former MOQ. The Marine officers inspected the residence. Russell told them that he and Shirley had met here around noon on Saturday to do some touch-up painting. According to Russell, Shirley volunteered to buy some paint from the base exchange at about 1.30. He claimed that she didn't take her car, but walked to the PX instead. Russell said he hadn't seen her since. Lieutenant Colonel Hodges didn't believe Robert Russell's story. It hit me as just totally a lie because the PX was probably four or five miles away. And there's no way in the world that she would have walked to the PX from their quarters. Outside the quarters, the officers also inspected Russell's storage shed. On the floor, Colonel Hodges noticed a rust-colored stain. Russell dismissed it as paint. Hodges was skeptical. He was no expert, but to him, it looked like blood. Lieutenant Colonel Hodges briefed the Naval Investigative Service. The NIS reported the possibility of a crime to the FBI's Washington Field Office. The NIS briefed special agents on the case. Captain Russell had been missing for three days. With no indication of her whereabouts, the agents followed standard procedure. Special Agent Alan Malinchak headed the case. When you have somebody missing, you either have a, a case of an abduction, uh, you have a case of a, a missing person, somebody who's walked away uh, for whatever reason, or you uh, have foul play. So the initial investigation that the FBI was involved in ran all three of those uh, investigative lines. Mr. Russell? According to standard procedure, picture. the missing woman's husband, Robert Russell, was the first to be questioned. Thank you very much. Thank you. He told agents that he was talking with a neighbor around 1.30 the afternoon of Shirley's disappearance when a friend of hers stopped by to pick her up for lunch. At 3.30, Robert said he called her bachelor officer's quarters to see if she had gone home. The duty clerk had not seen Captain Russell, so Robert left a message. Around 4 p.m., Robert borrowed his housemate's car and drove to Pennsylvania to spend the weekend with his parents. 
feel personally threatened by this? Or did you wait During the first interview that I had with Robert Russell, he was uh, very calm, very businesslike, uh, wanted to assist the FBI in the investigation and provided me with multiple uh, uh, locations of where Shirley might be, who she may be associated with, what could have happened. Midnight phone calls. Russell thought it was possible someone had abducted or harmed her. Though Shirley had no enemies, the couple had experienced some trouble due to their interracial marriage. Russell told agents he and his wife frequently visited his hometown near Mahanoy City, Pennsylvania. One afternoon, while shopping, the Russells were harassed by racists. According to her husband, Shirley had been frightened, but another incident scared her even more. An unidentified man had called their house on base. Hello? The caller used racial epithets and threatened to harm the couple. How'd you get my phone? Whoever the caller was knew where the Russells lived. After the threatening phone calls, Robert told officials he felt Shirley might need protection for the times he couldn't be with her. shop near base. Robert picked out a 25 caliber Raven semi-automatic just two days before Shirley disappeared. Russell told agents he surprised Shirley with a gift on the day they met to clean their former quarters. According to Russell, Shirley was appreciative of the pearl-handled weapon. Thank you. Agents were suspicious of the story. As a Marine captain, Shirley already had a personal sidearm. If she felt unsafe, why would she need another gun? With Shirley and the gun nowhere to be found, that question would be difficult to answer. Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell had vanished from base housing on March 4th, 1989. Her husband was the last person to have seen her. Agents needed to corroborate his story. The FBI interviewed Marine Captain Patrice Gale. According to Robert Russell, on the day Shirley disappeared, Captain Gale had arrived at Shirley's former residence to pick her up for lunch at about 1.30. Gail confirmed this. Robert also told her that Shirley had gone for paint and hadn't returned. Captain Gail thought this was odd. Shirley never missed appointments. And this one had been especially important. Just a day earlier, Gail had accompanied Shirley to the base legal office to pick up her separation papers. Shirley planned to present them to Robert the day they painted their former quarters. This would make their separation official, and Shirley worried about Robert's reaction. Afterwards, she would need a friend to talk to and ask Captain Gail to meet her. When Shirley failed to show up, Captain Gale worried that Robert had done something to her friend. FBI agents checked Shirley's bachelor officer's quarters. The clerk had not seen her since Saturday, March 4th, the day she disappeared. On that same Saturday, Corporal Dan Carraway confirmed that Robert Russell had called looking for his wife. The corporal noted the time in his logbook is 3.30 p.m. 
About a half hour after he took the message, Caraway thought he saw Captain Russell. She was talking on the telephone. He recalled that she was wearing jeans and a maroon sweater. He wanted to give her the message that her husband had called, but he was distracted. By the time Caraway was free, the woman he thought was Captain Shirley Russell was gone. His description contradicted Robert Russell's statement that Shirley had been wearing a blue jogging outfit. The corporal also only saw the woman from behind. He never got a good look at her face. Agents doubted if she ever returned to her apartment. They found no trace that Shirley had changed her clothes or brought back the separation papers. Investigators questioned Russell's old neighbors. One of them said she saw a blue station wagon backed up to the Russell shed on the day Shirley had disappeared. She noted the time was 5 p.m. This was an hour later than Russell claimed he left for Pennsylvania. Investigators wondered if Robert Russell was mistaken or lying. Agent Alan Malinchek called the FBI in Pennsylvania to pin down Russell's whereabouts the rest of that day. Special Agent Michael Quirk of the Allentown office became co-case agent. He contacted Robert's parents. Robert Russell had traveled to uh, St. Clair, Pennsylvania on March 4th, 1989 and he uh, stayed with his family the, uh, the weekend of, of March 4th, uh, March 5th. FBI interviews with Russell's family confirmed he had arrived alone. None of them had seen Shirley. The FBI launched a media campaign seeking the public's help. Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell's photo was featured in television and newspaper stories leads began to pour in. Midway between Quantico and Robert Russell's hometown, a clerk in York, Pennsylvania called federal authorities. The clerk reported that a young black woman had been in the store on the afternoon of Saturday, March 4th, the day Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell disappeared from Quantico. According to the clerk, the woman bought several items and paid with a check. The clerk asked the woman for identification. She produced a military ID card. She resembled photos the clerk had seen in the newspaper. The agent asked to see the checks received on that day. He found that none of them were written by Shirley Gibbs Russell. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer worked with the FBI on the case. He noted another detail that suggested the woman in the store was not Captain Russell. The color of the ID and the location of the picture in the ID described as belonging to Shirley Russell was the ID of a dependent military person, not of an active duty military person. There had been no activity since March 4th in Captain Russell's bank or credit card accounts, nor had she called her family or friends. Considering Shirley's stable character, her disappearance didn't make sense to Agent Alan Malinchik. She was the type of person who was going to do very well in the Marine Corps. Um, she would be promoted. Um, she had that capability. She was sharp. She was uh, squared away. She easy to make friends. Everybody that worked with her liked her. She had a lot of stability in her life with regard to church and family. Um, for her to just disappear of her own accord uh, just didn't make any logical sense. With no word from her or a kidnapper, agents believed it was likely that Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell was dead. They were now searching for her body. Dozens of Marines fanned out across the huge base. They searched hundreds of acres of dense woods the Marines used for training. They found no trace of the missing captain. 
Perhaps Robert Russell knew more about his wife's disappearance than he was telling the FBI. Agents asked him to submit to a polygraph examination. He agreed. That the last time you saw her, you were painting your quarters, and it was sometime prior to 3 p.m. on Saturday, March 4th? That's correct. As before, agents found him to be cool and cooperative. For almost three hours, Robert Russell answered dozens of questions relating to Shirley's whereabouts. Mr. Russell, could you advise me where you... He was subjected to three separate exams. Was this red spot paint, Mr. Russell? Yes, it was. Each time, Robert Russell was found to be deceptive. When agents told him the results, Russell seemed unfazed, almost smug. He even consented to be fingerprinted. Perhaps he was aware that polygraphs were inadmissible in a federal court of law. Without a body, agents would need something stronger than a hunch to prove that Russell had killed his wife and disposed of her. In the spring of 1989, the FBI continued to hunt for the body of Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. In their search for answers, agents delved deeper into the background of their prime suspect, her husband, Robert Russell. Special Agent Michael Quirk learned that Russell was already married before he met Shirley. He had two children with his first wife, Pam. The marriage only lasted six years. In 1986, Russell told his wife that he wanted a divorce. He left Pam and their children on Christmas Day. Six months later, Robert married Shirley while they were both stationed at Paris Island, South Carolina. The FBI learned that Shirley was transferred to Quantico a short time later. They also learned that Robert told friends that the distance was hurting his marriage. He claimed he was leaving the Marine Corps to join Shirley and Quantico in order to stabilize their relationship. But agents discovered a different motive for the move. Agents believed it was unlikely Robert would voluntarily relinquish his rank as captain. Being in the Marine Corps was Robert's whole life and whole world. Military records showed that in February of 1988, while stationed at Gulfport, Mississippi, Robert's superiors found that his passion for the Corps did not seem to apply to its regulations. They issued Robert a less than honorable discharge for dereliction of duty and defrauding the government. He was escorted out of his office and was prohibited from taking anything with him except his own clothing. Although Robert was no longer a Marine, he moved into officer's quarters at Quantico based on Shirley's rank of captain. While Shirley supported him, Robert tried to get his life back on track by becoming a teacher at a nearby high school. But his drinking started to become excessive. He was getting drunk more often and staying out later. Robert? Shirley was distraught. She joined Al-Anon, a support group for the loved ones of alcoholics. When Robert became physically abusive, Shirley finally left him. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer believed that Robert's problems left Shirley few alternatives. She realized that marriage was, was going nowhere, began to get counseling from a local counseling center that was made available to uh, members of the Marine Corps. She also consulted with a um, Navy lawyer 
to begin the divorce process. To investigators, Russell's instability and abusive behavior reinforced their belief that he was capable of killing Shirley. His personality could not tolerate the fact that this black woman, his wife, was a Marine Corps captain who was successful, who was succeeding in her, her career, and to top it all off, wanted to divorce him. Agents learned that during her separation, Shirley had sought refuge off base with her close friend, fellow Marine Captain Ann Mack. Captain Mack told Agent Malinchek that Shirley was afraid of her husband. She intended to leave him, but needed a place to stay. She had asked Captain Ann Mack if she could stay with her at her townhome in the Springfield, Virginia area. And uh, Captain Ann Mack uh, agreed and uh, laid out some ground rules about uh, Bob Russell not being there, uh, not coming into the house, uh, uh, nothing like that whatsoever. But it was not enough to keep Robert away from Shirley. Mac was worried about her. Mac told investigators that Robert was stalking Shirley. On several occasions, he showed up at the house early in the morning as Shirley was leaving. He harassed his wife until she agreed to spend some time with him. Mac said that Robert Russell was living off base. He had moved in with one of his new colleagues. An FBI agent checked the address. It was the home of Sandy Flint. Sandy Flint offered little. She said she knew nothing about Robert's missing wife. On the way out, the agent met Robert Flint, Sandy's father-in-law. He was a retired painter who had worked at the base at Quantico for 10 years. Mr. Flint told the agent about a conversation he had with Robert Russell two days after Shirley's disappearance. Robert Russell asked them how to clean up uh, stains from concrete floors. And the father-in-law had told Bob Russell that you could just use chlorine or soap and water and that would pretty much clean it up or dilute it. And Bob had asked him, well, what if it's blood? And, and the father-in-law had said, well, you could use muriatic acid. Mr. Flint told the agent something else of interest. Sandy and her husband had recently separated. He suspected Sandy was now having an affair with Robert Russell. With each new person agents interviewed, they found more deception from Robert Russell. If Sandy was indeed involved with Russell, she might know if he had killed Shirley. Agents would inform her it would be unwise to obstruct a federal murder case. Sandy agreed to speak with the FBI. This time, agents found her to be far more cooperative. She described her role in Robert Russell's obsession. She had admitted to having a, an intimate affair with Bob Russell while Bob Russell was still married. Um, she advised us that she, at Bob's request, she had surveilled uh, Shirley Russell. She could report to Bob uh, Shirley's activities and whereabouts. He enlisted her as his spy. Sandy told the FBI, Russell was convinced that Shirley was having an affair. He wanted to know where Shirley went and who she met. Sandy followed her everywhere, but found nothing to support his delusional fixation. And he was so compulsive, he wanted to catch his wife cheating. Of course, the irony of all of this is she wasn't cheating at all. It was he who was cheating on her. Robert was too far gone for logic. 
he refused to believe the assurances of his mistress. In his own mind, if he was cheating, so was Shirley. And he would go to any length to prove it. He told Sandy that he broke into his wife's car and planted a voice-activated recorder. When it failed to record anything incriminating, he decided he needed to get closer. Robert broke into Ann Mack's house to bug Shirley's bedroom. What happened next told Sandy that her lover's obsession had completely consumed him. Robert called his mistress from his wife's bedroom, speaking in a whisper. He won't believe where I'm at. He told Sandy he was drinking Shirley's wine and reading her journal. Then he said something she would never forget. He had informed her that if uh, Shirley comes missing, uh, it'll be me, I'll have taken care of her. And uh, she had said, we well, can't do that. Uh, you know, she's they're gonna look for her. He says, and if anybody questions you on this, uh, deny it, uh, don't even admit to the conversation we're having now. Sandy's statements were incriminating, but it was her word against his. To corroborate her story, the FBI needed physical evidence. We requested a consent search of Captain Ann Mack's residence. They retrieved several items, and, and some of those items, one was a telephone and one was a wine glass. And when we sent those to the FBI laboratory for analysis, we were able to develop uh, Robert Russell's fingerprints on those items. The FBI now had its first piece of physical evidence to corroborate that Robert Russell obsessively stalked his wife. But without Shirley's body, it was still not enough to charge him with murder. In March of 1989, there was little evidence to link Robert Russell to the murder of his wife, Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. Early in the investigation, agents learned the suspect had been having an affair with Sandy Flint. Flint now told the FBI more about the day Shirley Gibbs Russell disappeared. She said Robert Russell had borrowed her car, a blue station wagon, to drive to his parents' house in Pennsylvania. She remembered he left her house sometime after 4 p.m. Sandy thought this was strange because he could have used his own pickup truck. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer believed Russell borrowed her car that day to transport Shirley's body to Pennsylvania. The reason he asked to use that car was because he had an open bed pickup truck, the body was still in the storage shed, and he had to dispose of the body. And he couldn't do it in an open bed pickup truck, so he borrowed the closed station wagon of his girlfriend to dispose of the body. Agents hoped to substantiate this theory. They returned to Russell's former residence, where his neighbor had seen the same blue station wagon backed up to his shed. Investigators needed to take a closer look at the floor, where Lieutenant Colonel Hodges had seen the rust-colored stain. But the stain was gone, at least on the surface. And as they were chiseling the, uh, the whitewashed pieces of the concrete up, uh, Bob Russell had asked them what's going on, and they had told him that they're taking these samples to determine what the substance is on the concrete. And uh, uh, Mr. Russell had voluntarily told them, well, I, I had cleaned that up with some muriatic acid. The FBI lab confirmed that muriatic acid was present on the concrete. the same substance that Mr. Flint had suggested Russell used to remove blood from cement. Technicians found no trace of blood or paint on the chips. What could have been a key piece of forensic evidence had been destroyed. Agents hoped Sandy Flint's car would reveal more. FBI examiners scoured the station wagon inside and out.
It was unusually clean for an older car that had so recently made a round trip from Virginia to Pennsylvania. It turned out to be another dead end. As the investigation stalled in Virginia, Robert Russell split up with Sandy, packed his things, and moved to Pennsylvania to start a new life. The FBI's investigative focus turned north as well. Agents followed Robert's every move. They observed that while he relied on his parents for support, he was very close to his brothers, Mike and Ron. Agents approached the brothers on several occasions. Mike Russell agreed to meet with agents. He told them that the day after Robert arrived in Pennsylvania following Shirley's disappearance, Robert took Sandy Flint's station wagon to a nearby car wash. Robert and his brother thoroughly cleaned the inside of the car vacuuming it and spraying it with deodorizer. Agents believed Robert's actions demonstrated his intent to remove any evidence that Shirley's body had been in the car. Mike Russell told agents he never saw a body. He did concede that his brother's behavior had seemed desperate since Shirley left him. Two months before she disappeared, Mike and his older brother, Ron, drove to Virginia to take away Robert's guns. Agent Quirk recalled that his brothers felt this was necessary to prevent Robert from hurting someone. He was depressed uh, in the fact that he was no longer in the Marine Corps, that he loved the Marine Corps. He didn't have money. He was a captain in the Marine Corps. Uh, now he's a special education teacher. Uh, Shirley had uh, removed him from her checking account, so he was having problems financially. Circumstantial evidence was mounting, but the FBI lacked one crucial piece of evidence for their case. Shirley Gibbs Russell's body. The first question was where to look. Agents learned the answer from Robert Russell's first wife, Pam. Robert's boyhood home was in Schoolkill County, a rural mountainous region in northeastern Pennsylvania. Thousands of coal mines, mostly abandoned, are scattered throughout the rugged county. Some are hundreds of feet deep and partially filled with water. As a young man, suspect Robert Russell had spent much of his time hiking and hunting in the region. His family said he knew the place like the back of his hand. A search conducted in this terrain would be daunting, but nobody ever questioned whether it should be done. 150 people participated in the extensive ground search for Shirley Gibbs Russell in early May. Volunteers from the FBI, the Marines, the Naval Investigative Service, and the Pennsylvania State Police participated. None of them were more eager to find the missing Marine than her own peers from the United States Marine Corps. Nine helicopters and six transport trucks filled with Marines were deployed. Over three days, they searched 2,000 acres of land. They never found Captain Russell's body. Agents would soon develop a theory as to why the search was not more fruitful. Agent Quirk learned about a strange phone call Ron Russell received from his brother, Robert. Robert had asked Ron if he could get him some dynamite. And uh, Robert had stated that, it, that he couldn't get dynamite in at Quantico because it was too expensive. And uh, Ron had asked Robert, why do, you, why do you want dynamite? And Robert's response was, I want to blow up Shirley. Ron never bought it. But agents now wondered whether Robert Russell had thrown Shirley's body into a mine shaft 
then sealed her grave with an explosion. The search did yield one surprising result. An agent found what appeared to be the grip of a gun handle. It was sent to the Firearms and Tool Marks Unit at the FBI's lab in Washington, D.C. for analysis. By comparing the samples to hundreds of other guns, examiners determined that it was consistent with the grip of a 25 caliber Raven semi-automatic. It was the same type of gun Robert Russell had purchased from a pawn shop on March 2nd, two days before his wife disappeared. Unfortunately, the tantalizing discovery would not help with the prosecution. Agents never found Robert's fingerprints on the gun part. To prosecutors, it looked as if the ex-Marine had covered his tracks well. Without a murder weapon or a body, it would be next to impossible to convict Robert Russell of murder. Very clear. After an investigation spanning two months, two states, and thousands of man hours, the FBI was no closer to arresting their prime suspect, Robert Russell, for the murder of his wife, Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. Though agents had gathered a significant amount of circumstantial evidence, Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer didn't have enough physical evidence to prosecute Russell for the crime. We didn't have a body, we didn't have eyewitnesses, we didn't have weapon, and it just took a tremendous amount of investigative skill and effort to put the pieces together, to go out and search out the leads, tremendous amount of hours and energy that these FBI agents took to gather the evidence. Authorities didn't even have enough evidence to make an arrest. Agents were frustrated, as were the hundreds of Marines whose lives had been touched by Captain Shirley Russell. It was like the loss of a child or, or a, a dear friend, and there was nothing you could do about it. And it, what frustrated me so much was she was so close to being extricated from her, her bad marriage. And for her to be uh, killed, it still bothers me to this day. I mean, it just. It's just one of those things that you just never really totally get over. It looked as if Robert Russell was going to get away with murder. But Russell's past indiscretions would come back to haunt him. We had uh, uh, been contacted by the Naval Investigative Service at Gulfport, Mississippi, that there was uh, some evidence in a, um, uh, in a locker there uh, that they had maintained from uh, when Bob was uh, discharged uh, uh, from the uh, Marine Corps. And so they sent it to us, and it turned out to be a floppy disk. It had been confiscated when Russell was relieved of duty in Mississippi, a year before Shirley Russell disappeared. For security reasons, no service member who has been relieved of duty is allowed to go through their documents after dismissal. One of Russell's former superiors found the disc and read its menu of contents. One of those items that he saw on the menu was the word murder. And he pushed the, uh, the mouse for that, on that word murder, and up came 26 steps, very detailed and elaborate, steps on how Robert Peter Russell was planning the murder of Captain Shirley Gibbs. Russell's plan clearly documented his intentions. The 26 steps was a, a very revealing piece of evidence because it showed the man's state of mind, his willingness to, to even contemplate murdering another human being, let alone his wife. Step one is leave Thursday, uh, January 18th for Paris Island. Well, who is that Paris Island? Shirley Russell. Make it look as if she left. Well, that's exactly what he tried to do when he did murder his wife. And then the last thing he says is uh, uh, blame it on her own kind. Uh, obviously referring to her race. This is a man who um, clearly had the, the mental wherewithal and, and intent and motivation to do this kind of act. 
On February 8, 1991, the computer file convinced federal prosecutors to bring charges against Robert Peter Russell for the murder of his wife, Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. Ironically, Russell was arrested in a prison. Need your stuff with us? He had recently taken a job as a substance abuse counselor at Pennsylvania's Graterford State Correctional Institution. New York. But prosecution would not be easy. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer would have to assemble all the pieces of circumstantial evidence like a mosaic. Hopefully, the jury would see the portrait of a killer emerge. Assistant U.S. Attorney and co-prosecutor Michael Rich would help to prepare the case against Russell. It was clear they were going to have to make it on you know, circumstantial evidence. Uh, a, a lot of that circumstantial evidence was uh, as a result of what Bobby Russell had been saying and doing since his wife's disappearance in eight, 1989. So the plan was to assemble all that into some sort of coherent scheme and present that. Never before had the federal government attempted to try someone for first-degree murder based solely on circumstantial evidence. At trial, the prosecution asserted that Robert Russell intended to commit murder when he bought the 25 caliber Raven semi-automatic on March 2nd. Sweet, how much? Several of his co-workers reported that he had told them a 25 caliber is a perfect weapon. It leaves little evidence behind. He said there is virtually no blood spatter, and the bullet usually lodges in the body. On Saturday, March 4th, when Shirley gave him the separation papers, he refused to sign. Just after noon that day, the prosecution believed Robert Russell snuck up on Shirley in the shed. for nightfall before he could remove the body. To establish an alibi, he talked with a neighbor and lied to Shirley's friend about his wife walking to the base exchange to buy paint. Okay, that's probably a good idea. See. Around 4 p.m., he went to Sandy Flint's house and borrowed her station wagon. After night fell, he wrapped Shirley's body in a tarp and placed it in the back of the car. Their neighbors saw it backed up to the shed. He then drove four hours to St. Clair, Pennsylvania with the body in the back of the car. Once there, he knew exactly where to go. There were hundreds of abandoned mines to choose from. Then, Robert Russell, who had once sworn to uphold honor as a member of the Marine Corps, dumped his wife's body into a mine shaft. dynamite in to bury the evidence under thousands of pounds of rock. The jurors were convinced. On May 3, 1991, Robert Peter Russell was convicted of murdering his wife, Shirley Gibbs Russell. Robert Russell was sentenced to life. There is no parole in the federal system. He will never leave prison alive. In Alabama, a series of deadly assaults shocks the community and frustrates police. 
All the killers leave behind are the dead and fleeting images on surveillance videotape. Local police and federal agents follow the killer's trail up and down the eastern seaboard. The shadowy fugitives keep running, but the FBI will not give up the chase. Surveillance video is often the most precise witness to a crime. Its images can speak for victims when they are unable. After three brutal murders were caught on tape in Alabama, the suspects fled the area. They had an arsenal of stolen weapons and swore they wouldn't be taken alive. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Racing across several states, the fugitives tried to elude the FBI, and agents hoped to capture them without more bloodshed. In the 1990s, Birmingham, Alabama saw a drop in both its population and its crime rate. But even in the safest cities, killers can strike. On May 18, 1996, a customer at a gas station discovered a body. Birmingham police responded to the 911 call. Crime scene investigators determined the victim, the station cashier, had been shot to death. He was the only employee on duty that day. The customer hadn't seen what happened to him. A trail of blood led back into the store and behind the counter. More blood there indicated the cashier lay briefly on the floor before going outside, perhaps hoping for help. He barely made it to the parking lot. Police first suspected a robbery shooting, but money was left on the counter. and the cash register had not been emptied. No fingerprints pointed toward a suspect. And no witnesses had seen anything. Investigators retrieved the store's security videotape and sent it to the police lab. The tape had degraded because it had been reused many times in the recorder. So the footage of the crime was blurry and few details could be seen. Police technicians tried to clean up the image electronically for detectives. The enhanced tape gave investigators a better look at the crime. It confirmed what the crime scene clue suggested. A lone customer shot the cashier, even though the employee was complying with his demands. It seemed he killed without reason. Technicians made video captures of individual frames and tried to enhance them in order to see the face of the perpetrator or any identifying characteristics. Birmingham police hoped to identify the suspect from the stills. Checking mug shots, they could not find a match. Detectives interviewed friends and relatives of the victim, trying to find some lead on the senseless murder. No one recognized the killer or knew who might want the cashier dead. Without any other evidence, 
the investigation stalled. Two months later, and 20 miles south of Birmingham, a call came into the sheriff's office in Shelby County, Alabama. Sheriff James Jones received the report of two people down at a pawn shop. We got the phone call. It really wasn't clear to us exactly what had happened. We had reason to believe that uh, the lives had been lost in the building. It happened so rarely in our county that I really was surprised when I got on the scene. EMTs determined the pawn shop owner had died from multiple gunshots. A female employee was in critical condition with a gunshot wound to her head. Uh, all other cars, when you outside, make sure they the sheriff ordered the deputies to stop any suspicious vehicles in the area. We really didn't know what we were looking for at this point. But we was in hopes that our people would be sharp enough if they saw something that was out of place that they would be able to uh, recognize that, stop that vehicle, and perhaps give us some leads from it. Stabilizing her as much as they could in the field, the paramedics prepared the woman for the helicopter ride to the hospital. Authorities determined more than $2,300 in cash and jewelry was missing. And the gun cases had been nearly emptied. Since the pawn shop had frequent customers, it wasn't difficult for crime scene technicians to lift hundreds of latent fingerprints. Connecting one of them to the crime might be impossible. The lead investigator was Shelby County Sergeant Michael DeHart. There was uh, really a lot of evidence processing to be done, fingerprint dusting, so on, but we didn't find any anything definitive as a result of that. The one thing that we did find that we did have were shell casings that were left at the scene. The murder weapon was a 380 automatic handgun. At the time, we didn't know if this was a, a one-time event that had occurred or if this was a part of a larger series of events. The in-store shooting was similar to the earlier gas station murder but this crime occurred during a robbery. Detectives checked for the shop security video. Then they remembered something. I was talking to the owner a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about putting a dummy machine in. He was talking about putting a real one over in this area. Sergeant Russell Yawn found the other machine in the actual surveillance videotape. The second or the real VCR continued to operate even after they took and unplugged and removed the tape from the dummy VCR. And it continued to record even until I, the time that I pushed the eject button. The videotape showed two young men entering the store at 3.23 p.m. They cornered the shop owner, forcing him behind the counter with the female employee. Deputy spotted a red pickup truck barely visible outside the shop. It might be the getaway vehicle. The suspects looted the pawn shop for 13 minutes while the employees watched. They then shot the hostages point blank. We saw nothing that told us that these two victims resisted or attempted to resist. They were very compliant. And, I, and I'm sure they did that uh, with the hopes that they would live. But instead, um, their life was taken by execution style. And uh, that, that was very disturbing to see that. What I don't understand is, this is just garbage. Just Sergeant Yawn and his partner, garbage. Sergeant Donald King, found more evidence near the spot where the victims had been killed. As we were doing our search at the pawn shop, we saw a small pile of garbage in behind the counter and we you know noted it at the time you know why was the the garbage there there was no garbage can it, it really didn't make a whole lot of sense at the time there was also some metal filings on the floor uh, mixed in with the trash the filings likely came from a key making machine installed on the counter detectives collected them for later examination they believe the killers took the garbage can, but they didn't know why. Federal law requires that anyone buying or selling firearms must keep records of the transactions. 
Detectives asked another employee to bring up the store's weapons manifest, comparing it to the guns still in the shop. They realized the suspects took an entire arsenal. There were 32 stolen weapons in the hands of vicious killers. We was very disturbed uh, about um, what else would they do, what were they doing now, and what would they do again in the future. Because of the potential for more violence by the heavily armed killers, sheriff's detectives immediately contacted the Shelby County District Attorney's Office. Prosecutor Randy Hillman joined the investigation. We like to be in on the front end of any investigation. It makes things a lot easier for us. It makes things a lot easier for the police officers working the scene as well. The surveillance videotape was the best evidence investigators had to find the killers. It showed the suspects carry out many of the stolen items in a guitar case. One of them shot both the shop owner and the employee. At one point, his gun jammed. Almost mechanically, he cleared and reloaded and then kept firing. The two suspects got into the waiting red pickup, both on the passenger side. There must have been a driver, a third suspect. Technicians made photos from video captures, but the quality was poor. Uh, we had photographs uh, of these individuals actually doing the execution. We had a partial photograph of the vehicle that they were in, but we didn't know uh, who they were. And the level of violence here was critical to us. I mean, we had to stop these guys before it happened again. Less than eight hours after the shooting, Investigators learned the pawn shop employee died in the hospital. Now there were two innocent murder victims. Technicians at the Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences examined the bullet fragments and casings found at the pawn shop. They compared them to those used in other area shootings, including the one at the Birmingham gas station, to see if the same gun was used. But the pawn shop bullets did not match any others. Still, investigators thought the two crimes might be related. They turned to the public for help. We were able to uh, distribute still photographs to the local media in the area and we enlisted their assistance uh, in getting the the pictures out there to the public and uh, to request assistance in identifying the perpetrators of these crimes. They kept several aspects of the crime secret to help identify more okay, reliable what, leads. The, address on Commerce Street? Okay. the media exposure generated dozens of calls. Okay, how many guys were there? One caller said that while driving in Birmingham, he saw two men fitting the description of the pawn shop killers. They were carrying guns and a guitar case from a red pickup into a house. Okay. The detail of the guitar case had been withheld from the public. Okay, great. Um, the caller said he knew the men, but only by their street names, okay. Turkey and Maine. Hey, Mike, we just got some Shelby County there. detectives took so. the information to Birmingham police. The Metro stuff. Department had a database on street names. Turkey was an alias for 16-year-old Marcus Presley. He resembled the shooter in the pawn shop murders. Maine was 18-year-old LaSamuel Gamble. He resembled the second pawn shop robber. The two had long juvenile records. Through court documents, they learned where Gamble lived. 
we knew that the people that we were looking for were very dangerous men. Uh, they had killed before. Uh, we were afraid that they would kill again. And so when we undertook these searches, we wanted to use every safety precaution available to us. So we used uh, tactical dynamic entries into the residences that we searched. The arrest team cleared the house where Gamble had been living. No one was home. Nobody in the house? Nobody? A pair of cold-blooded killers with an arsenal of stolen weapons remained on the loose. Everybody's inside. We'll set up a perimeter. Okay. Thank you. Don't see any movement. On July 28, 1996, Alabama investigators searched for Marcus Presley, LaSamuel Gamble, and a third suspect believed to be involved in a double murder at a pawn shop. The tactical arrest team entered the house where suspect Gamble lived, but they found no one there. Armed with a warrant, detectives searched the house. Shelby County Sergeant Russell Young recovered evidence that directly linked the suspect to the pawn shop murders. During the search, we found the videotape that, that came from the dummy VCR. It was destroyed, the case was cracked and broken, the tape pulled from the, uh, the housing, and it indicated to us that they were aware that they were being recorded, and they had the presence of mind to stop and try to remove or eliminate all evidence of their crime. They also found an empty guitar case. It appeared to be the one taken from the pawn shop. Sergeant Donald King found more evidence in the kitchen. We were able to find a garbage can, and in the bottom of it uh, had some labels, uh, some price tags and so forth from some of the guns and some of the jewelry from the pawn shop. And it also contained some of the same metal shavings that we were able to tie back to the, bur to, to the robbery scene. Sergeant Michael DeHart was frustrated that they didn't find any of the 32 stolen weapons. At the time that we did the search, we knew that three people were involved, but the third person we didn't know. Um, when we did the search at the residence, we found a paycheck stub uh, in a coat pocket uh, that had the name Stephen McKenzie on it from a business in the Boston area. So, paycheck stub. Perhaps McKenzie was the third suspect who drove the getaway vehicle. David fairly recently. He had no local address, but neighbors said he was a friend of Gamble and Presley. Court records listed Marcus Presley as living with his grandmother. There's nothing here that can directly be tied to the pawn shop. Investigators searched that house too, but found nothing there that related to the crime. That's 10 4 1230 3rd Avenue West. Presley's grandmother arrived home as they were executing the search warrant. Yes, ma'am. We got a search warrant to search this resident. Can I go in my house? Uh, not right now. We're doing an investigation of a robber, but you can speak to these two people right here. Ma'am, I'm Chris Curry with Shelby County Sheriff's Office. Do you Detective showed her video captures from the robbery. Tell me if you recognize him. Two people. She admitted one of the men looked like her grandson. She had tried her best to raise Marcus, but he got involved with drugs and gangs and had been in trouble ever since. Thank you very much. You've been very helpful. But again, I apologize for the inconvenience. She said he would disappear for weeks at a time. We'll take him a few more minutes to finish. She was devastated to learn that now he was a murder suspect. The suspect's apparently constant movement troubled prosecutor Randy Hillman. They were young, they were mobile, they didn't have any uh, home base that they operated out of like normal people have a, a home that they go to and from. Um, they had several different residences that they would frequent. Detectives canvassed the neighborhood where Gamble and Presley hung out, interviewing anyone who might know the suspects. 
Several people in the neighborhood said that lately, Gamble and Presley had been flashing jewelry and giving away guns to members of their street gang. Some said they heard the suspects were still in the area and offered addresses where the young men might be staying. The detectives checked all the addresses. Gamble and Presley seemed to have disappeared. We had one last place that we wanted to look before going home that particular day. We were on the way back, and the suggestion was made, let's ride by uh, the uncle of Samuel Gamble. Let's ride by his house and, and just see if anyone's there. We did that, and when we did, we saw a red pickup truck that matches the description of the vehicle that was used in the robbery. It had no plates, but they could see the vehicle identification number. The detectives noticed a Massachusetts parking permit in the corner of the windshield. They hoped Gamble's uncle would have information about the suspects. The uncle agreed to answer their questions, but not at his home. He did not want to be seen with the cops. They took a drive so they could talk. The uncle told investigators that the truck belonged to Stephen McKenzie, a friend of his nephew. It was the same name as the one on the Boston pay stub. The uncle admitted that his nephew recently stayed at his house with Mackenzie and Presley. The trio had cleared out several days ago. Sergeant Yon believed the uncle knew details. And at first, he really didn't want to give us any useful information. But we continued, and uh, he did admit that they had left town, and they had gone to Boston. A check of the red pickup's Massachusetts parking permit confirmed that the truck belonged to Stephen McKenzie, the suspected getaway driver. Everything going OK? Eventually, the uncle gave investigators permission to search his property. He suggested they look under the porch. There, police found a paint gun. The serial number on the gun matched one taken from the pawn shop. There was enough probable cause to impound Mackenzie's pickup and process it for evidence. But the technicians did not find anything that tied it to the pawn shop robbery homicide. With the possibility that the suspects had left the state, Shelby County authorities contacted FBI Special Agent Jeff Newton. They requested FBI assistance in locating suspects that they had identified as they believed to be responsible for this terrible crime. Uh, at that point, uh, I got information from the case from the sheriff's department representative uh, realized that we had enough probable cause at that point to apply for a federal unlawful flight to avoid prosecution or ufap warrant the fbi re-interviewed the suspect's friends they told agents gamble and presley were acting desperate and volatile and that the pair had promised, if the law ever caught up with him, they would not be taken alive. In Alabama, 
Authorities struggle to find the men believed responsible for two robbery homicides. The state increased the reward for the capture of LeSamuel Gamble, Marcus Presley, and Stephen McKenzie to $100,000. FBI Special Agent Jeff Newton believed the suspects left Alabama for Boston. Anybody who's a suspect in a double homicide uh, is automatically rated at the highest priority. I immediately notified our Boston office, you got bad guys heading your way, we believe, or may already be there. We, I gave them lots of details, everything I learned from Shelby County pertaining to their level of violence, you know, what they look like, we were sending photographs, we were sending full physical descriptions. At the Boston, Massachusetts FBI field office, Special Agent Joseph Altman received the priority call. The three individuals were identified to us as vicious killers, that they had made claims to the effect that they would not hesitate to kill again, that they would not be taken alive, or that they would take, that they would take the life of any law enforcement officer that attempted to stop them. Birmingham agents also sent Boston a list of places they should investigate. One was the construction company where suspect Stephen McKenzie had worked. Agents went to speak with the owner. The man said he had not seen the suspect in weeks. If McKenzie was in the Boston area, he had not made an attempt to come back to work. The owner had an employment record, but it did not contain any new address or other information that would help find the suspect. Boston authorities staked out the other addresses that Birmingham had sent including one of another uncle of LeSamuel Gamble. But they did not approach this house immediately. We did not want to let on that we were surveilling this particular home. We wanted to allow at least one or two areas, uh, homes in the area that they could return to. After several hours, they spotted a man leaving the residence. Looks like he's in there. It was not one of the suspects. They waited until they were sure he was alone and not being watched. How you doing, sir? I'm Special Agent Daniel and Special Agent Frenzy. We'd like to ask you a couple questions if we could. All right. Um, do you live in that building? He was hesitant to talk but did say that neither Gamble's uncle nor the suspects were in the house. But he had seen them. He told us that both Gamble and Presley had been staying at this location, but they had since moved out. He did not know where they moved to. We felt that this location was no longer uh, vital in our, in our investigation, so we obtained a, a search warrant and searched the home and did not uh, discover anything of lead value. Another address on their list was in Roxbury, a suburb south of Boston. An agent set up surveillance there. It meant more long hours with no promise of a payoff. On August 1st, 1996, the Boston FBI held a press conference. Uh, we believe these individuals to be extremely dangerous, most likely armed. They're wanted in Alabama. We'd like to bring these individuals in. They distributed wanted posters and asked anyone with information to call a special tip line. Hey, what's 
The media campaign produced dozens of leads. One was an address outside Boston, where alleged getaway driver Stephen McKenzie was said to be staying. There was no word whether Gamble and Presley were with him. The tactical arrest team had to be prepared for a fight. They caught McKenzie off guard. But Gamble and Presley were nowhere to be found. The two fugitives remained free and on the streets with an arsenal of stolen weapons. In August of 1996, the Boston SWAT team arrested one of three suspects who had fled Alabama after two robbery homicides. The suspected getaway driver, Stephen McKenzie, was unarmed and taken in for questioning. Good work, guys. Thanks. Investigators searched the house where he was staying. They found jewelry, later determined to be from the Alabama pawn shop that was robbed. They also recovered three weapons. Running the serial numbers of the guns, agents learned they were among the 32 weapons stolen from the pawn shop. But nothing in the house indicated where LaSamuel Gamble and Marcus Presley were. Boston agents held McKenzie on a charge of receiving stolen property. They contacted prosecutor Randy Hillman in Shelby County, Alabama. Immediately after receiving that telephone call, we got on a plane and flew to Boston to, to help the Boston investigators. They hoped McKenzie could lead them to the elusive armed killers. We knew the level of violence and the numbers of guns that they had and what a danger they posed uh, to, to other people. The Shelby County authorities interviewed McKenzie. Mr. McKenzie, you know why we're here. Our major concern is that these weapons are going to get back out on the street and someone else, innocent persons, are going to lose their lives. And they confronted him with the evidence they had, hoping for sentencing leniency. The suspect began to talk. We sitting around or whatever and drinking and we just decided, hey, let's do it. He said that he, Presley and Gamble, planned the pawn shop robbery in mid-July. They drove by the shop to check it out. Gamble said it would be a good place to rob. There were guns, jewelry, and cash inside and no security. I'm, I'm positive. It was guaranteed that, you know, no one would get hurt. It was just a in and out thing. On July 25th, they returned in McKenzie's pickup. Gamble and Presley went inside while McKenzie waited. They were only supposed to grab the money and valuables. But then McKenzie heard shots. They took what they came for, then fled. Kenzie said Gamble and Presley had run with him to Boston. I mean, I mean, I don't know. And that they might still be in the area somewhere. I'm 
Investigators were unconvinced. He claimed that he did not know where they were at the time, which I don't know that he did. Uh, he did give us some information about where they had been staying, the different houses that they may have gone to, uh, and some other information. I think McKenzie held out on us. Uh, I think McKenzie knew more than what he was telling us. At trial, McKenzie's testimony would be attacked. The prosecutor turned to the one unimpeachable witness, the surveillance video. He sent the tape to the FBI's audio and video processing lab in Quantico, Virginia. The task of cleaning up the footage fell to video program manager Dale Linden. This tape was a VHS recording on a security system. It had, I would say, fairly poor quality as far as resolution. Uh, it had a, a backlighting issue where the camera was facing towards the windows. At some point, some of the people in this video scene uh, looks like silhouette. As people moved around, the closer they got to the camera, the better uh, images we were able to retrieve. Focusing on the portions of video where the perpetrators were nearest the camera, Lyndon began enhancing the images. Once we digitize these images, we will go through each one. And depending on what the problems are, we will apply different types of filter processes. In this particular case, the first thing we did was we, we did some contrast uh, adjustments to make the images uh, look brighter and, and, and focusing in primarily on, on the subjects. In this particular case, I felt that we did some improvement to get facial detail uh, of, of the face and the weapons and also their movements within the store itself. The results strengthened the case against Gamble and Presley. Now authorities needed to catch them. The FBI continued their stakeout at a house in Roxbury, Massachusetts, where informants said the men might hide out. It was the best lead so far for FBI Special Agent Joseph Altman. We surveilled this house for approximately 48 hours. The street information that we had was getting better and better all the time that the individuals were holed up in, in this house. We thought that we saw move, movement in the house. Are they ready? This is Special Agent Frasker, SWAT ready? Field agents told the SWAT team to prepare for entry. Right before the go word was given, a man left the target house. Excuse me, sir. How you doing? Agents believed it was Gamble's uncle. They knew he was on probation for a felony offense. In accepting probation, a person gives up his Fourth Amendment rights. He can be stopped and searched at any time. Oh, that's what we wanted to find out. Put them in. It's procedure. It's all right. I don't care about your cut. Gun! Agents Stay found a handgun. Right. This was one of the weapons that uh, was actually stolen during the robbery in Alabama, one of the 32 weapons that were stolen. He told us that the subjects were no longer in this house. However, we felt that since he was related to the subjects, and then he had a stolen weapon on him that we could not take this information at face value. So Boston SWAT uh, went ahead and made the entry. Gamble and Presley had sworn never to be taken alive. So the SWAT team prepared for a shootout. We uh, felt that the only way that they were going to be extricated from, from the house was through force. The tactical arrest team swept through the house, clearing each room as they went. Okay, clear. 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 Good job. Good job. 
No one was inside. However, they did find um, some travel bags belonging to Presley and Campbell. Inside these bags were a couple of weapons, in addition to a photograph. The photos showed the fugitives getting on a bus. The travel bags contained the shirts worn by Gamble and Presley at the pawn shop. Investigators also recovered one of the guns used in the pawn shop robbery. The uncle confirmed Gamble and Presley stayed at the house. He said they left on a bus for Virginia, where Gamble's girlfriend lived. The FBI and Boston police had missed the dangerous fugitives by a matter of hours. On August 5, 1996, fugitives Le Samuel Gamble and Marcus Presley eluded an arrest team in Boston. An uncle told agents the men had left for Virginia where one had a girlfriend, but he did not know exactly where. To narrow the search, the FBI obtained the phone records of houses in Boston where the suspects might have stayed. For nearly 48 hours, agents combed through the records, looking for common numbers. According to FBI Special Agent Joseph Altman, they found one. We did find a, a common phone number that occurred about two and a half months before the murders took place and about a week after the murders took place. The number was in the Norfolk, Virginia area. Boston agents contacted the FBI's Norfolk field office. On August 8th, Special Agent John Harley received word from Boston to apprehend the young fugitives. Youth can be a factor in making somebody a little bit more unpredictable. If, if they're older and more set in their ways, they may even have a past pattern of uh, conduct that we can look at and, um, and, and help us in apprehending that person. But with uh, these two individuals, um, as young as they were, uh, they proved to be very difficult because they were not predictable at all. At 5.30 the next morning, the fugitive task force arrived. You in there? Yeah. An individual came to the door who we weren't sure matched description or not initially, but uh, we went ahead and detained him there at the door and asked if we could go ahead and consent to search his apartment, at which time he said we could. See these guys? You haven't seen them before? The resident recognized photographs yeah, of the suspects. The individual uh, who we talked to provided us information that he had had party recently at his apartment and that two individuals matching the description of Presley and Gamble had come with a uh, girl that he knew. The place was empty, but the resident gave agents the girl's address. Time is starting to tick by, and uh, we then have to head over to try to locate this apartment where this girlfriend is, is uh, apparently living who's associated with the two subjects. An arrest team quickly assembled outside the target apartment, a third story residence. Norfolk police helped cordon off the area while agents assessed the building for entry. It's now getting to be about nine o'clock in the morning, the sun's up now, and we were getting concerned that if the two subjects were sleeping that uh, they weren't gonna be sleeping for very much longer, and we would prefer to go in if they were Obviously, not awake. The arrest team split into two groups and moved in. We decided to make our, our main effort uh, use the most people uh, to go up the fire escape, which isn't uh, the most conducive route, but it was the route that we thought offered the most uh, surprise. We also then stationed uh, two special uh, state police agents 
on the front door, which would have been in the interior hallway, just to make sure that any bad guys didn't run out. The agents did not have the time to obtain a search warrant for the apartment. To get inside and make a legal arrest, they would have to see the suspects or get permission. They spotted a resident through a back window and took a risk. We announced to him who we were and that we were looking for a couple of individuals and asked if he minded if we took a look around. This older gentleman then stepped aside, nodded, come on in, and uh, that's when we made our entry. They found Presley first. We immediately uh, handcuff him and detain him. He had no opportunity to warn his friend. In a rear bedroom, the team found Gamble. The agents positively identified Presley and Gamble from photographs and placed them under arrest. U.S. Marshals transported the fugitives back to Shelby County, Alabama. When questioned at the county jail, the Samuel Gamble blamed Presley for the murders. When they spoke to Marcus Presley, he had a different story. Each believed they had destroyed the surveillance tape. Presley and Gamble both still thought that there was nobody alive from the robbery who could say exactly what happened. Uh, they continued to point the finger at each other, saying, he's the one that did it, or, or it wasn't me, it was someone else, until they saw the videotape. Once they saw the videotape, they realized that no longer could they lie about it, that we had them actually doing the executions. And the whole tenor of the conversation changed then. Eventually, Marcus Presley, after pointing the finger several other places, uh, Presley confessed and said that he did do the killing. How about this for you? Presley also yeah. confessed to another crime. Okay. He had been the shooter in the gas station murder in Birmingham. He said he thought the cashier was going for a gun, so he shot him. In 1997, the three suspects had separate trials. For his role, Stephen McKenzie received 50 years. An Alabama jury convicted LaSamuel Gamble of capital murder and sentenced him to death for being part of the pawn shop slayings. Marcus Presley received the death penalty for killing the gas station cashier. Another jury sentenced him to death a second time for killing the pawn shop employees. When the jurors saw this tape, they were shocked. People are used to seeing violence on television, and we've seen so much of it that you kind of become detached, that it, it becomes old hat to you. This was an actual videotape of two people being executed, and it had a profound impact on the jury. Actually, the owner of the pawn shop was an unwitting participant in the investigation of his own murder. Uh, by having the dummy VCR and putting that, that tape in our hands, showing the actual executions, uh, he helped us solve this case a lot more quickly and, and with conviction, with, with absolute certainty. Whereas if we hadn't had this tape, it would have been a guessing game.